The Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. Thirty years, no, four, four fifth, no, fifth. How many years is it? See, oh, I can't be bothered anymore, Kev. <laughs> of, of all this hurt, wait. <laughs> Jules Rimet still blooming gleaming, apparently, <laughs> but not in this country. That's how up to date we are this week. Yeah, I saw yeah. I saw the football like so many times, Kev. I realise the round ball isn't everybody's sport, and indeed, nor England. But I, I did. I saw, I've seen the football so many times, like you have, I'm sure, at weddings, usually in the summer. I don't care about the World Cup, by the way. It's just a pretend Mickey Mouse one, anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I saw it. Um, through the eyes of other people, as always, wedding guests at a wedding. Um, it was interesting, by the way, at the venue where, and you know this venue, it's called Cripps Barn. You, appa- yeah. you apparently know the uh, the chef there. Did you see him? Did you see Davey? Well, no, I didn't dare, because when oh. I was there a few years ago, that was the chef that said, you can tell the f***ing photographer to f*** off. Yeah, when I asked to go... <laughs> Bro- I told him you were coming, he had you something special prepared. Did he? <laughs> I'm sure he did. Was that the... <laughs> It was I actually tell him amazing food, really, really amazing food. Good. And I mean that. Uh, whether he did something special on my plate, I, I don't know. Don't want to think about it. But <laughs> but anyway, so it was good. You can tell him that. But the uh, yeah, I watched it through the eyes of other people, and uh, the, they they took at this at the barn because you can't get very good phone signal there at all. So yeah. there is there is pretty decent Wi-Fi there. And there was the code then. You could use the code to watch telly really, really easily. Mm. But it was funny how just prior to kickoff, the frame with the code was taken down. Mm-hmm. The sharp people had managed to uh, to photograph that frame earlier on. And so, so the word spread. Now, fortunately, unlike some weddings where it does take over a bit, it didn't. There was just two small crowds. But I, I watched the goals go in and really through other people and photographing other people's faces. Mm. And it's that sort yeah. of look at the end where you think, oh, you poor old. And and the last bit was, du- was during the dancing. And there was just one half of the dance floor that looked dejected. And the other half were going mad and dancing. Yeah, how many more those days? How many? How many more years now do we have to wait to the next one? Oh, it was two years, isn't it? Will it be summer? A lot, lot longer. A lot longer for me. Well, what, what's happening for you? Oh, well, we've never won it. You keep saying you keep you, you rolling me up into the royal we. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I'm I'm a royal Welsh. Maybe we should join all together. And and uh, oh, that would never work. Would the Fuji Cast. Can you imagine that? I mean, the the home nations joining together for football. They do it for rugby. Why not for football? Huh? No, I can't even think of anything. Many things worse than that. <laughs> there would be murder on the on the terraces. <laughs> Would it? Okay. Right. Well, welcome to the Fuji Cast. Um, is there a chance this is the last one before Christmas, Kev? Let me just look at the dates. It's the twelfth of December today, so nineteenth. Yeah, it will be Boxing Day, Kev. It will be our Christmas special. The next one. Oh. Yeah. Cool. Have we woken you up or something? <laughs> yeah, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, I've not been in the best of uh, situations this I, week. I but know, uh, it's been a bit tough for you. You've been in a bit off. Are you but all yes. right now? Have you fed yourself up? Are you, are you rattling? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, You are? I'm okay. Okay, all right. Um, well, welcome to the Fuji Cast. Your questions, um, you send them in via Facebook, which Kev will read out, or you send them in via email, the ones that I'll read out. Uh, also, we should uh, thank our sponsors, pick Time. Uh, dot com, um, who uh, who help us bring the show to you um, e- every other week? It's uh, are we still doing Christmas specials? Are they still doing Christmas specials now, or, or are we a bit too late? Do you think? Uh, to- no, you, yeah, you can still do your holiday um, uh, things yeah. on pick time. Uh, this is entirely up to you how long you run those things for, isn't it? But I think holidays in terms of the American marketplace also includes like the Black Friday stuff and everything, yeah. which of course has gone. Um, but Christmas is still coming. That's true. Yes. And, and so I you guess, carry on. And I guess you can that, use pick yeah, time to yeah. up your sales. And, and also into the new year. I suppose you could have some New Year sales, couldn't you? That's one of the... You can just yeah. carry on rolling them through to New Year. Then it yeah. becomes Valentine's Day. Then Easter specials. Then before you know it, we're back at the World Cup with Wales and England. 
Yeah. So I, I dare ask about your week because you've had a challenging one this week. You've had the lurgy this week, haven't you? A lot of lurgy going around at the moment. A lot of lurgy going around, indeed. I yeah. think you should do some voiceovers, Kev. You've, you've, you're. Have you ever heard of a guy called Red Pepper? Red Pepper. No. He sounds like he should be in some kind yeah. of special online film. <laughs> he does. I'm sure Red Pepper's actually in the Virgin uh, Airlines adverts at the moment. But anyway. If you're not in the UK, you won't have seen them. But but um, Red Pepper, there's this wonderful story about Red, who was a tube train driver. And he had this, well, he still has, obviously, this kind of really deep voice. And he would use the voice to talk to the passengers. And there's some lovely stories. Uh, you know when sometimes a tube train stops between stations in the tunnel? Yeah. And um, the driver will come on sometimes and say, don't worry, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be, you know, just waiting for a signal to change. We'll be on the move very soon. And sometimes the lights flicker on and off. Mm -hmm. um, and he would say, he would say, don't worry, we'll get there. Or will we? And <laughs> stuff like that. And he was heard, apparently, by a, a top producer of films who um, ran to the front of the train when they got to the station gave him a card and said, call me. And he never, quite literally, never looked back because now he is the voice that does inner world. Yeah. He does all the inner worlds. Oh, well, there's, yeah. a, there's a few. There's a couple of American guys and there's Red who who puts on an, an American accent and does them. So mm -hmm. There we go. <laughs> no, yeah. the, there you go. There's, there's a new business for me. Yeah. In a world far away, such as Malmesbury, we have two inches of snow. You do, don't you? Yeah. So I mean, it's, it, does that mean it's a day off school for for the kids? Well, it's uh, if the snow's still here when this goes live. Yeah, <laughs> they'll remember where you are. Yeah. <laughs> then uh, yeah, my kids will be really furious about that because you're not that far down the road. But they'll be saying, "How comes Albie's got a day off school, but we haven't, Dad?" Well, Albie is under snow for real. Yeah, it's odd actually because we don't we we we've got the we've got we're the split of two rivers, so we we don't. I mean, we have had snow before, but yeah. we don't, you know, we, we tend to, we often miss it when others get it. But I, last night it was bitterly cold. I went, yeah. I was, I had to go into the car and it was minus seven on my car dashboard. Was Gemma making you sleep in the car? <laughs> yeah. Get out, man. It's got, got to that point. You're snoring too much. <laughs> um, minus seven. Bitter. Like it was, you know, I was walking um, through the town and it was, it was silent and like the, the weight of the of the, the cold weather was just killing all ambient noise. You know, it was it, even the trees seemed to be like hunkering down together. It, it does, just, doesn't it? It just goes deathly silent. Doesn't yeah. It? yeah. But for, we we weren't forecast snow. And then I woke up this morning. I thought you were. I thought there was like a, a band that sound like sound like a. It weather, wasn't weatherman yesterday. Now. It wasn't forecast no? for us. Okay. But then I woke up this morning and the kids came bounding down the stairs. It's snowing. <laughs> Out Rosa, Rosa, Rosa. Do they still get really excited? Oh me? yeah, Rosa will gal be up. She was. I heard him run into his room. Take a look out the window. <laughs> I'm getting the sledge. She yeah. said. <laughs> get up, Dad. <laughs> she went into the garden to get the sledge from wherever it was, and they've gone. They've, they've oh, gone. they're of an age now where they they can... were up the stairs. Yeah, they walked yeah. to the stable. Like trying to get them to walk to the stables normally is is like D not happening. A challenge. No. But like let's walk to the stables. <laughs> Uh, but you went. two stayed in bed. I stayed. Well, Gemma went with them. I Did stayed. She? Well, I'm, that's where they are. I'm here with you now. Is that <laughs> that's it? That's where they are. That's, I'm, I'm your date for, for the, it, the yeah. recording session. Oh, that's quite nice. I think it's very romantic, Snow. I like it. I like Snow. Mm -hmm. But then I can say that because I'm not driving hundreds of miles to a wedding today or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when I don't enjoy Snow quite so much. No. Uh, but yes, you, you've, you've done a wedding in the snow already this year, Kev. Yeah, it snowed uh, on Saturday, uh, Friday's wedding. Where are we? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, only a little bit. Yeah. Only a little bit. Oh, en enough for you to do really nice romantic Christmas portraits like I know you love doing? Yeah. Yeah, did all of that. Yeah. <laughs> Got them to kind of stand up by a Christmas tree and all that stuff. Yeah. Did you? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. Questions. Where do we go? Um, should we go with fa the book of face first or yeah, should we why not? dig into to email? Up to you. Why not? Why not? Well, Let's go. I'm just scrolling to the end. Uh, Thomas Pinches says, Hi, Kev. Hi, Neil. In a recent episode, Kev mentioned in passing that he assigned a function button to shutter type. It's got me thinking. I have my shutter type set to electronic front curtain up to one two thousandth, mechanical from one two thousandth to one eight thousandth, and electronic above one eight thousandth. 
The reason Fujifilm offers this as an option was, I assumed, because A, manual shutter less than one two thousandth risks shake from a moving shutter which electronic front curtain mitigated against b mechanical from one two thousandth to one eight thousandth is because mechanical shutter doesn't risk the effects of rolling shutter and c the mechanical shutter only works up to one eight thousandth so electronic shutter takes over my question is why does kev choose to have control over the shutter type what's the downside to this setting and how does kev decide what to use and when Thanks both, Tom in Devon, um, whose Instagram is Thomas Pinches, T-H-O-M-A-S-P-I-N-C-H-E-S. Does he? I don't know. <laughs> but ask him, Thomas, do you pinch? <laughs> it's not a Morecambe and Wise joke, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, in the I, as you know, probably had a nosebleed during all those numbers and things. <laughs> <laughs> you can answer a question in the third person about yourself. <laughs> yeah so well i mean i'll keep it really simple the reason i have the um electronic shutter and the, and the ability to choose between the two of them is nothing to do really with rolling shutter or anything like that these days right. the sensors are, are much better than, than they used to be but ultimately i like to if if there is no banding visible in a church or the ceremony i will always use the electronic shutter right because it's totally silent and i also like to be able to shoot wide open sometimes especially during the um hugathon i quite <laughs> like to shoot those at f1.4 yeah um and if it's a bright sunny day that i need to be shooting at sometimes up to one thirty two thousandth of a second yeah. so with the, with the electronic shutter yeah with the electronic shutter yeah, yeah. Otherwise, I'd just let the camera take the stream. Uh, talking of uh, buttons and things, and uh, Lewis, we've had a couple of. Do you remember I was saying how do how do you do um, uh, such a, do a, a format on an X one hundred V? Yeah. Um, delete and rear command dial. It works also on the X one hundred V. Says Lewis Craig. Right. There we go. Yes. So that's, there we go. That sorted us out. There was. A, I thought there was another one in here. I, I might yet find it. There was another really good shortcut. So good, I've lost it in all the emails I've got, Kev. Which I thought, oh, Kev would be really impressed with that one. And I've lost it. I will find it. Ma Mark Adams. Uh, hi, Kev. Hi, Neil. I was very disturbed to hear that Kev... Oh, they're all having a go at you this week, Kev. Mm, been a week, I tell you. I know. This sounds like one of those... You know that programme on the BBC, Disturbed of Norwich, has written? <laughs> <laughs> I was very disturbed to hear that Kev has resorted to a camera with a PASM dial. Hold your horses on that one. Uh, this yeah. one came in at the end of November, so this might need updating if you haven't heard the last show. Or, or it wasn't on the last show, was it? It, it, it was on our, our pop-up, wasn't it? Pop -up. Yeah. As a long-time Fuji fan, I've recently rationalised my cameras to two X-T4s, which are now both set up identically. This makes them really easy to use. I do miss the X-Pro2, though. Me too, actually. I miss the X-Pro2. My question is, how does Kev get on with shooting with multiple different camera layouts? Are you missing shots due to fumbling and mumbling with the wrong button like I did? Regards, Mark Adams. Which is a very good point. And yes, we did sort of, well, we did address this, talked about this. And it is an old chestnut, isn't it, really, uh, of using different cameras. Now, I tried this over the summer, Kev, with the X-H2S and, um, and the X-100V, which I love. And I thought... As a combo, perfect. And I've, I've used it for a couple of gigs. I did it also in Norway and a couple of other weddings as well. And I, I surprised myself that it's actually not as hard to shoot with two entirely different types of cameras as you would think. Yeah, to go back to the original part of that question, the PASM, I have given up on the X-H2S. It is being sold. I have um, a second X-T5 come in, um, delivered today, in fact. Are you literally waiting by the door then, Kev? Uh, if, if it's brought by DPD, I, that's the that's my favourite, favourite, favourite courier because you can watch, and it's always Dave, our way, you can watch yeah. Dave, it counts him down. You know, We have Jorg. Jorg. See, there we Yorg go. Is, is my one, yeah. Yorg and you can see Dave. his little picture on him on the map. That's there, right. <laughs> you follow him along. You are delivery number 82. Jorg yeah. is currently a delivery number 53. Jorg is currently <laughs> having his lunch in the cafe. <laughs> That's it. How comes Jorg is not moving between 53 and 54 for an hour and a half? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So it's arriving today. Yeah. There it is. Kev, it's your, yours. Jorg is here. I will be uh, offloading XH2S. I will yep. also be offloading my old X-T4, a couple of X-T3s, some lenses. All going. Bye-bye.
Bye bye, but, cameras. I mean, bye bye. I'm I'm surprised you've you. I am surprised you've gotten rid of it, as they say, because what, the XH2S. Yeah, because such a wonderful camera, and in, in, no, in hybrid terms of filming and and also no. stills. I mean, I've just I've got to say, Kev, I'm surprised. No, I couldn't. I just couldn't. Don't get me wrong. It is fantastic. But I don't like the viewfinder. I don't like... I, I've done... I've looked at the images the X-T5 co creates compared to the X-H2S. Now, of course, remember the X-H2 has the big 40 megapixel sensor, but the X-H2S yeah. doesn't. Yeah. And it, it's not about the 40 megapixels, but there is there is something... It's really hard for me to, to explain, but there's something more filmic, I think, about the images on the 40 megapixel sensor. Do you think so? They look different. They just look different. I don't like the viewfinder on the well, X-H2S. Well, I cannot stand the fact I can't change between manual and um, single shot focus okay. easily. PASM, I've got a PASMism. <laughs> I just you can't do PASMs. Yeah, no. Basm's not for you. It can pass them off. So sent. Let's go through the the, the sensor is obviously a different. It, it's a forty megapixel sensor. Okay, so that's different. Yes. In terms of filming, what what's the codec like? Is it the same? No, no. XH2S is much better for filming. You, know, you can do. I think you can do six point two K on the XC five, um, and you can do four K, but only sixty frames per second. So basically, everything that I'll ever need to do is fine on the XT four yeah. on the XT five. Technically, the XH2S has got the better autofocus system and, of course, can do 40 frames per second, and neither of which I, you I mean, used no, or no, require. No. So now it's it. No, drop that. I've made my mind up. It's done. And What's I, the difference I, in cost, Kev, between the two cameras? XH2S is, um, I think, it was something like eight, eight, nine hundred pounds more expensive. Maybe not, not that much, but XH2S is more expensive. Yeah. Okay, so two XT fives. Actually, economically, when you think about it, if you're wanting to to have same bodies, obviously it makes more sense anyway, doesn't it? Yeah, I, um, I, just, I, just, I shouldn't. I shouldn't yeah. have rushed the XH2S. I, mean, it was, I was. I was. But yeah, impatient. but you didn't know the XT five was coming out so quickly, I didn't, did you? No, nobody. I did not know that, and he, no. so so people don't believe me when I say these things. But but you, I, no, I know you didn't. I know. You otherwise, didn't. I wouldn't have bought the thing. What about the screen? I mean, did, uh, the the because I know very little about the XT five, but maybe because I didn't want to look at it because I was thinking, oh, don't look from behind the sofa. You might like that more than the XH two S. But does it have an articulated screen on it? No, it has the back to the original. XT3 screen, yeah, Back which most a lot of people prefer. Yeah, yeah. I actually don't. I prefer the, the screen on the XH2S. Yeah. So well. that that sort of answered to your question, Mark. That uh, yeah, he's no, he's he's not a pasmist. I'm an anti pasm. Anti pasm. Does she know anti? What's her name? Anti Nancy. Anti pasm. Uncle Dial. <laughs> yeah, <that's it. laughs> um. But in, in terms of shooting with two different cameras, you, you've done it for a long, long time. Sounds like you're not going to be doing it for too much longer, but you've done it for a long, long time. And it's never been a problem for you, has it? I've never had a problem shooting with different cameras in yeah. terms of like XTs and X Pros and X Pros and X100s and all that kind of stuff. Probably because I haven't had the PASM though. And I, Yeah, but I never really had. I did, the problem for me with the X-H2S and the, and the X-T5 that I got and the X-T4 I was using previously and the X-Pro yeah. is not the, the difference between the two cameras. It's the fact that one of them is awkward for me to use. Right. I ain't, I ain't clever enough to use it proper. Oh, Kev, you are. So I need to, you know, I need to kind of change that. But yeah, it's not a case of, you know, the difficulties of using two different cameras. It's just one of them particularly was just not working out for me. No. Well, the X-T5, Jorg is um, is uh, appearing any moment soon. I hope he doesn't get stuck in the snow. This might be, I, this will probably be the last time I see him before Christmas. I should give him a fiver. Do you give, do you give your bloke a fiver at Christmas? Well, the DPD guy. Yeah. No, I never have. Should I have been doing that? Yeah. Yeah, you should do. Stop some breaking things next year. Oh, Dave never does that anyway. It's good as gold, is Dave? I have given Dave the occasional coffee. Yeah. So he knows when he knocks on the door, I say, Dave, do you want a coffee? Oh, go on. I'll have a quick one. Go on. I bet not many DPD drivers. Maybe I shouldn't have said his name. <laughs> Maybe they're not allowed to do that. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Don't worry. He takes it away with him in a cup. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorted. Right. Um, yours from the uh, Book of Face. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. 
Robert Lysakowski. Ah. Lysakowski. Yeah, I think I'm, that's right. Yeah, I think uh, so. Hello, Kevin and Neil. Yes. Greetings from the colder part of Europe. God, oh. I bet it ain't... I, I reckon right now, Mr. Robert Lysakowski, <laughs> we might be even colder. I don't know. Maybe not. Where is he? What country? He doesn't say. Oh! <laughs> okay. uh, well, yeah. it's no good saying that without knowing. Uh, I know. However, it's a, yeah, I, I'm guessing it's Poland or something, you know, judging by the, the surname. Where that, that beast from the east, quite literally... Blows yeah. from so sometimes. It's still colder than us. Yeah. Uh, I've been infrequently listener, uh, mostly due to inability to understand all what you were saying. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but after one week in Scotland, <laughs> suddenly I can understand it all. Pure magic. Not sure what you've done when I was there. Anyway, I have a quick question <laughs> um, to Kevin about his long lasting, soon ending romance with Fujifilm. Which of your ideas, suggestions were materialized into true features? implemented in the cameras have you had any great ideas which was never implemented and you still think is a mistake well dude before you answer that question kev while, while he did say can you read out the first part of the uh the way he said long lasting i didn't quite say that again yeah my eyes are not working as quick as i used to um where is the sentence now he says um quick question to kevin about his long lasting soon ending romance with fujifilm soon ending I I just I know he I know it's probably lost in translation a little a little bit there and he doesn't mean this necessarily but I just did want to point out that that your romance with uh, with Fujifilm is is one of those purest ones in terms of the fact that even though you're no longer an ex photographer well you are an ex photographer you're an ex ex photographer yes. <laughs> <laughs> and technically uh, that I haven't the 31st of January the yeah. 31st of December yeah, is my so you're still my leaving due it's a big leaving due but <laughs> I think it's impressive of the, in the fact that you um, have remained uh, and you will remain with them because it's a, a system you genuinely, genuinely love and believe in. And, and yeah. for all those that have said across the years, oh, you just get free kit. I'm sure there's been moments where you've you've had stuff because of, well, my God, the amount of stuff you must have sold by virtue of what you've said about Fujifilm. But, but you've always bought your own kit. And yep. and I think people um, don't realise that, and I, I just I just I just want to underline that the fact that I think um, I do think it's a shame you're leaving. I can say that because I'm not associated with the brand in that in that respect. Uh, is it? It doesn't. It, it make honestly. Listen, it makes. It, yes, I I would prefer to still be an photographer, but I uh, the the fact is that the world changes. It, it does it, change, but but I want, I I think it's important pointing out that you're not you're not the kind of person that. that that when walking away from from um, from this fantastic communicative relationship you've had with this brand across a decade, just say, "Well, that's it. Now I'm going to go and have a." I didn't like you anyway. Um, no, no, no. You never do that because you are no. you, you you're a purist about that brand. You always have been, and uh, as long as it suits you, you all, in in terms of they make kit that you enjoy, you always will be. Yeah, and as you know, as Andreas will testament, I've said to him many times that I, you know, I the reason I use Fujifilm cameras is not because I'm an ambassador; it's because they're good for me and my business. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. you know, it, uh, uh, if something had ever come along or ever comes along in the future where I think seriously, actually, that would make give me a better competitive edge, then I I would think about it. Yeah. And that was that's true in the future, as it was when I was an ambassador. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, it's it, for all intents and purposes. You know, I will I will disappear gracefully from the the social element of um, Fujifilm UK at least, and uh, but other than that, nothing else will change. You're always still, allowed to go to the lounge downstairs at uh, the Hop, aren't you? I'll still be friends with them, and I'll still be. There, I mean, um, there's a, banging there, on their door yeah, and asking of course you will. questions. There's, and, yeah, there's a there's a there's a seat at the Hop downstairs in that easy area that has your name on it. They'll have to open up a wing, the Kevin Mullins Memorial Wing. <laughs> Memorial. You can have a memorial while you're still alive, can't you? <laughs> have we just written him off? I do feel. I don't. I don't. I feel. I feel closer to not being alive. Now. <laughs> Pop another one. Right. Go on. What was the rest of the uh, question? Uh, oh yeah. What was the, which? Have any of the ideas materialised? And are there any that haven't? Well, within reason. So, so, so for example, the the view mode button on the XT. Yeah. was, if I remember rightly, when we did the design stuff for the XT1, they showed us the XT1 before it was announced, and there was no view mode button on it. And so it kind of pointed that out, and then we went for lunch, came back, and then there was there was a view mode button stuck on the on the side of the prism in the in the diagrams that we were looking at, and with a big arrow on it saying, Kev's button. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and 
And again, if I remember rightly, and this might, might have been a joint kind of conversation, but the introduction of classic Chrome was was definitely... Was that you? Not necessarily just me, but right. I think Bert, Zach, I can't remember the meeting now, but there was we had there was lots of conversations about the next, like a film simulation, mm. and, and we all kind of, we were all pushing towards the, the Chrome, uh, Kodachrome type emulation, although it's not really Kodachrome. When it when we when the new set of lenses were um, uh, the new kind of uh, range of uh, refresh of lenses were were done, yeah. Um, we had, again we had the meeting and we were in Dubai I think for that one where it was like which lenses should you know which lenses should go next, and I was the only person to um, to vote and shout for the eighteen mil. <laughs> <laughs> and literally everybody else was like, nah, don't worry, nobody ever uses the 18 mil. I was like, no, you must do the 18 mil. That is the most important lens. And it was the one they did. Yes. Well, so, there we go. So they do listen to Mullins. Um, yeah, and other, like lots of other little bits and pieces, such as, I mean, at one point it did look like the um, X Pro was going to have internal memory only. And I, I proper threw my toys out of the pram about that. Did you? Um, <laughs> not that that makes a massive difference because I am just one voice. Um, yeah, but I think and, that and you're a voice they, they've listened to. I think they've all joking apart. I think they've yeah, res- in, respected in part, your, your voice. In part, of course. Um, but, you know, let, I want to make it abundantly clear that they, you know, they only come for like ideas and things like that or had yeah. done in the past. Yeah. Um, the the actual design and, and the decision making is made at a much more granular level and mm. based on same economic principles rather than what Kev wants. <laughs> um, but yes, and there are plenty plenty of things that I've pushed and asked for over the years that I've just met with an eternal we shall consider. <laughs> but you never know. Watch what? this. Watch this space. Yeah. Well, like a sequel, you'll be back next year. I'll be back. <laughs> and unlike other sequels, it'll be even better. <laughs> right, let's uh, hear from our guest for this week. Is a sort of a... Uh, oh, 30 years. Oh, God, we don't have to go all through that again, do we? There's a World Cup reference coming up here from uh, an old friend of the show, Chris Orange, who, who I thought would be... Uh, would be good to talk to for for several reasons uh, it, a subject we don't talk about at all on this show is food photography and and it is actually a growing genre so that's that's number one but number two it's where the food photography has taken him and some some real honesty in terms of of numbers money money in it that sometimes i, I think some photographers find very hard to discuss um, i might have been on a nosy day that day as i was asking these questions kev But um, here's our guest for this week. This is Chris Orange. We talked about food photography before, Chris, and it was nearer the start of your journey, I think. Uh, You are food and interiors. Is one side of the business busier than the other? I know we've got this excellent news to talk about, so uh, don't don't do a spoiler on that one. But in terms of interiors and food, what's more important to you? The, I mean, in some ways, it's quite seasonal. So yeah. there'll be times where food will be the main thing for a number of weeks, particularly at the start of seasons when um, new menus are being designed by mm. chefs or restaurants. And then there'll be seasons where I do a whole string of um, interior shoots. They might be for um, huge warehouses, um, massive, like, you know, where they put things like Amazon and those types of things. Yeah. Um, or they'll be down to um, hotel shoots where they do a refurb. And so I find that over the year, it kind of travels up and down between those two. Um, and, and sometimes they go hand in hand. You might go to a, a venue where they want you to shoot their food and whilst you're there, you'll shoot all of their interiors yeah. and headshots and, you know, etc. This question is going to be entirely out of um, out of sequence, but I'll ask it while I remember it. Uh, I know working in commercial photography, one, one of the things that I find hardest, I don't do a lot of commercial work, but I do bits of it, is working to a brief, which makes it sound that I... <laughs> Like I'm a, a complete nightmare to work with. Not at all. I just like that idea of reportage and and being reactive um, to something that's happening in front of you. How difficult is it to work with food stylists, agencies, people who will have their own idea of what looks good in a photograph where you might not necessarily agree? Yeah, it can be really dif- difficult. Um, it really depends on how you connect with that food stylist or we really with the client if the client just trusts you 
and says to you and the food stylist or the prop stylist, whoever just says, you know, I trust you to get on with it. Yeah. Then it's great because you can work with them and you can try out things and be creative. But what often happens is, is that when you begin to go down that creative route, um, as you will know, as a creative person, there can be a journey between where you start and where you finish. And that journey can, for a while, produce some questionable images whilst you are journeying towards where you want to be. Because you are experimenting with lights, you're yeah. experimenting with props. And if your client is looking over thinking, yeah, I don't really like the way this is going, it depends on how how good they are at allowing the leash to kind of, you know, to go a bit. When they're great, you end up in an amazing place you know, 15 minutes of that, you can get some incredible photos. But sometimes they're very strict and you just get sent a mood board beforehand yeah. and they're like, we want this, this, this and this. Yeah. And you basically have to go there and recreate. Um, but it, it calls upon your technical skills as a photographer. And then on one level, it, it can be seen as a difficult kind of dampener on your creativity. Um, you can't kind of branch out and do whatever you like. But on another level, it teaches you how to produce professional professional kind of photographs to quite a high standard when perhaps you wouldn't have tried that hard yeah. to get there because you're but you're being made to, to kind of do that so you have to learn new skills i would i would imagine chefs sometimes I mean, you're talking about the client the client at times must be the chef and the chef alone yeah i mean they're, they're often not, often not the ones who are paying for it um sometimes they are if you're shooting um particularly for michelin star restaurants yeah. then the chef mainly is it's built around him or her yeah. and so they are the client but then often there's others involved as well their, their managers or their agencies these days michelin star chefs i like celebrities and they've got their own old, whole teams around them that you have to work with so you are kind of working with a team yeah. um, to make the project work. Something rather amazing has happened to you, which, which I want to come to, but can we run over some of the tech basics for what you do, which is unusual for me because I, I'm doing that and it seems it seems relevant actually or um, when, when it comes to food that I'm, I'm saving the best part of the plate to the end. Uh, so I'm going to go for I'm going to I'm going to go for the vegetables first because I always <laughs> I always save my my lovely pork with us with the scratchings and the nice, and nice. the potatoes and the Yorkshires right to the end and I, I'm going to I'm going to polish off the carrots first. You know my children they they say <laughs> best till last. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so uh, tech basics, which is unusual for me because I'm usually about the why over the how, but breaking the yeah. habit it's important for this kind of photography. Yeah. Let's start with um, lighting. Okay. Flash versus constant light source, or if you like, versus nout at all when it comes to um, additional lighting. The answer is all three, all the time. Right. So if I am shooting for um, in, a, in quite a darkly lit room that needs a powerful light, mm. then I often use flash because no matter what you do with continuous light, it's just not as bright no. as a flashlight. And so I'll then use one or two different flashlights to create that. If I'm working somewhere that's got a reasonable amount of natural light, but still looks a bit flat, then I will take in um, one to three continuous lights, which I will then use scrims around yeah. um, to create that softer look. And then if I can if I can get away with it, I use no lights at all mm. and use a window for a key light and try and make it look a bit moody. Two, two particular items that I think are extremely difficult to photograph. We'll take a bottle first, the, the, yeah. the lowly bottle, <laughs> which is a, which is probably one of the hardest things to photograph, isn't it? Pain in the neck. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's difficult. I mean, the worst case scenario with those situations is you do not want your softbox light to be left on the bottle. No. Um, or any other lights you want to create a clean sometimes you do want to leave a, a light on there but you want it to be a strip mm. um, rather than splotches of light all over it so the way to do that is to bring your is to experiment with your soft boxes um, and bring them often from from behind um, the bottle so you mm. can kind of it will hit the bottle and shine through it and you can you can come from the front as well and then you maybe will use a scrim. Um, for those who don't know what scrims are, they're like a diffuser, which is, you can buy them in different stops. So you might buy like a two-stop scrim, which is what I have. And it will really dampen the lights and it will basically protect it from hitting that horrible, nasty kind of blotch of light on the bottle. And then for a secret kind of trick, what you can do is you can get a tiny LED light and put it under the bottle. 
under the bottom yeah or even just behind it slightly yeah. and that will release a lovely set of lights and in... then you, yeah you see the gorgeous color then don't you yeah so yeah. if you look at any of the shots that i've done um on location yeah say with the whiskey when i when i was in iceland or um italy with those i was i had this tiny led light which i put just behind so you couldn't see it and it just lights the whole bottle up what a great and then idea. you can shoot it with just daylight yeah. and the whole thing just looks beautiful and you don't have to worry Let, let's talk about the kit that you use you were using um the xt cameras um but now you've moved exclusively to gfx haven't you so xt yeah. x pro all gone all gone in fact in about two years ago i began a journey for, for my other work which is the landscape work i was trying to find an alternative to film photography which would look authentic but i didn't want to keep spending all the money on film especially medium format film because it's like two pounds a click yeah. and so when you when you're shooting landscapes on a mountain and it goes wrong you spent a fortune <laughs> so i thought how can i find digital that looks more like grainy film so i went back and bought up as many first series x trans one cameras as i could I bought XM1, I bought XE1. I, I literally went through so many Fujifilm cameras. I bought them from MPB, used them for a bit, sent them back, bought another one because they're so cheap, like 200 quid or something for a camera. Mm. Um, so MPB became like my library for cameras um, <laughs> for about a year or so. And um, I was looking for this look and I found it. It was perfect. Those older, those older Fujifilm cameras, they've got such a filmic look to them. Yeah. Um, which I just adore for um, landscape work. And on that journey, I was really looking at color reproduction for commercial work at the same time and thinking which x -trans sensor can give me something that looks accurate, not retro, but accurate. And the x -trans 4 is obviously a great sensor, um, especially if you're on ISO 160 and you're using, you know, flashes, it looks brilliant. But in the end, I had to jump onto the GFX because the difference is just huge. Is you know, you, it, it's just, you can't really, you can't describe it, but it is just a massive difference between those two sensors. And so I, as soon as I got into the GFX with the 50R, within about two months, I bought the 100S. What you get with the medium format sensors is you get the um, true color reproduction, um, which you just cannot get on a smaller sensor even a full frame won't give you complete true reproduction without a lot of retouching. Whereas with the medium and the large format, when you shoot a picture of say a carrot, <laughs> um, you get your color yeah. of that carrot yeah. back. And when you start to kind of look at your files online, you just realize how it's, um, it's producing exactly what you saw. Yeah. Um, and it's important to get it right with food because chefs don't like their food looking the wrong colour. Um, yeah. Food shape is important. A low plate of food brings all sorts of issues because you can just yeah. throw it down and do a flat lay, but you don't want to do a flat lay all the time, do you? I mean, the, the idea of having just ni nice mountainous burgers, spongy looking burgers and what have you, fantastic. Yeah. But it's, food isn't generally like that, is it? It's usually quite low to the floor. Yeah, and or the place. it can get really difficult with... Um, particularly if the food isn't Michelin star, yeah. it tends to get flatter and flatter. <laughs> I don't know why that is, <laughs> but it just does. And so apart from the burger, obviously, and fish and chips. Um, but yeah, and you, you've you just got to treat it like a person. Mm. I always think a good food shot, it's like taking a good portrait. Yeah. And so if you can find the, the, the angle for the dish that looks the most appetizing and beautiful and shows the colors um shows as much of the dish mm. in terms of what's on offer um shows that in in the right direction as well and as well as making the hero the hero it might be the meat mm. or it might be some other vegetable whatever well it won't be the carrot it won't be the carrot no. not be a carrot no <laughs> <laughs> um, but you want you basically want to make that look like yeah. a really for want of a better word sexy portrait you know it's got to look like this is really appealing to me um, so I just imagine it as a person. I just think, right, this this food's a person. What's its best side? Do, do you um, ask? I mean, it is a very important point that you've just made that uh, often food just looks. But sometimes, uh, to me, when food comes out at um, a wedding venue, it looks like the chefs actually sat on each one personally. <laughs> but <laughs> that and that's a bit of a battle, isn't it? Do you ever plump yeah. them up? Do you do you do you remodel the food yourself? Yeah, you I mean, style the, the food stylists. Yeah. If I'm working with food stylists, they will bring tweezers, they will bring syringes, yeah, they yeah. Do all kinds of things to, to give the food some life. If it's just me, 
then I tend to not get involved in that. And I decide, well, that's the food that you want photographed. You don't want a food stylist, therefore you don't get food styling. And so I will just try and make it as best, you know, look as best I can. I, I would imagine this is um, this has been a, a real self-training process, hasn't it? I mean, YouTube is a wonderful resource in itself, but not the only resource. Um, learning from others, being inspired by others. It has been a journey, hasn't it? Yeah, a massive journey. I shot my first food shoot having never shot any food um, in my life. And it was mm. for a, a, a celebrity chef. <laughs> um, and I did just literally just turn up and do what I could. Thankfully, it worked out. Um, but that was just about taking the jump when the opportunity came up. And then I went on a long journey of forcing myself to um, be really disciplined, to learn as much as I could about flash, as much as I could about um, the camera that I was shooting with and depth of fields. And I did some amazing, I learned from some amazing people, um, some of them online, some of them um, uh, on YouTube, some from just from their courses on their websites, and just read a lot as well. Yeah. And just really just put myself in as many difficult positions as I could to see if I can get out of them. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> um, yeah, I just thought, well, you know what, take it. Take if it. I think when you do take make that first jump into professional photography, yeah. you know, and it was like, this is like 10 years ago. For me, it was like, if I'm going to do this, I've just got to do it and just go for the ride yeah. and work as hard as I can to make this work. And so I just did. And, and, and thankfully, every time I needed some sort of knowledge, thankfully, I, I just learned it <laughs> with the a week before. So come on then, the big opportunity, it's quite the coup. You've done very well, actually, not to mention it. Uh, you've, you've played the game extremely well. It's an event, <laughs> it's an event many would like to be at, me included, if you do need somebody to come along and hold your bags. Yeah, uh, It'd blah, be my first choice. Blah, 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 blah. So what is it? It's the World Cup. Yep. Um, the FIFA World Cup. Um, I've, uh, yeah, I'm going to there for about five or six weeks <laughs> to photograph all of the, um, it's, it's from the angle of all of the hospitality. Yeah. So I'm shooting all of the um, hospitality for the VIPs. Well, how, how, uh, how, I mean, how did the job even come along? I mean, I, I know that you're, you know, as you, as you go through the profession, obviously you network and you meet people and you talk to people, yeah. people pass your name around. But this is, uh, this is, this is a very different kind of networking opportunity. Yeah. On one level, it's very different because obviously it's a world stage yeah. and it's, it's a big event and it's something that lots of people would, um, you know, be able to relate to on another level for me, it's the same thing that I'm shooting week in, week out for lots of smaller things. Mm. So I'm already kind of in that hospitality industry. Um, so a lot of my commercial work is within hospitality. So whether it's for a, a chef or for a hotel or, you know, a magazine, even they're all still within that same umbrella. Yeah. And so, um, for me, it's a kind of a natural thing to, um, take that to somewhere like the world cup from, from kind of my clients, it's about capturing customer journey. And so you are photographing everything from their surroundings to their position whether it's on the track or whether it's the position in the ground to watch the match, um, then watching the match and the action happening and then the food and the extra things that come with that package that they've chosen. And so you're kind of, your job is to really make that look as best as it can so that it can be resold again after for future events. Are you actually photographing? It sounds like you're doing some reportage, some documentary work based around yeah. the people that are, are attending as well as yeah. the food. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you, it's 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 a little bit like being at a wedding in some ways, mm. because you are shooting, um, you're shooting everything from the food through to people's reactions. Um, you know, the, the, the jumping up in the air and the screaming when someone scores, yeah. or when you know, it's really the whole story of families who are coming together yeah. and they want to. You can see that they're having such a great time. You want to capture them in their in that moment because very often for people this is like the highlight of their year or decade. You know, they've saved up for this you know, amazing event and they're having such a good time. And so you want to, to be able to give them as well sometimes um, the images. Um, so sometimes I will send them images if, if I get chatting to them just so they've got a nice memory of that. Um, so you really are. It's a mixture of, of different styles. And then you're obviously the big kind of this is the World Cup. Yeah. You know, you're, yeah. in, you're in the yeah. final um, or you're in the semi-final or whatever. You know, you want to show 
that um so that uh, that can be used for marketing how do you sit in this genre chris um it, it's a business where people do know each other uh, and i wonder if photographers help each other or whether they're a bit guarded because this is one of those situations where i would imagine there's a few um envious eyes looking on to to you receiving this gig um yeah i mean I guess there might be i think that i do as much as i can to help other photographers that i meet along the way mm. If I'm set so like while I'm away, there are five weeks that I can't shoot in England. And so the bookings that are coming in now for December, I'm having to recommend other photographers yeah. who want to do food shoots or want to do other things. So I'm doing my best to kind of keep sharing out the work as much as I can. But I guess in the end, you've got to walk the journey that gets put before you, haven't you? And just and just enjoy that and make the most of that. Because you don't know how long that's going to last for, you know? I'm not asking what you get paid. I wouldn't dream of it. But I am intrigued to know um, the sort of day rate food photographers generally work to, probably more toward the start of their journey. Okay, I would say that if you are asked to do a food shoot and you're just beginning your business Mm. now and you want to get work, I think you should, beginning, I'd say you're looking somewhere around, if I was starting out now, I'd probably think somewhere between five to 700 pounds right. for a day. And that includes all retouching? I think, yeah, you'd want to get everything done. Yeah. For me, I'm very specific about speed and it's quite a big deal for my clients, especially if you're in, um, involved in press releases yeah. and that kind of thing. Yeah. And so I tend to turn around all of my shoots same day or next day. And so you're providing a very quick service and so you're not spending a long time on the retouch you're looking to get it right in camera um and so you just had a very small amount of retouching to get it to where it needs to be um so i would say start there the top three photographers um are probably charging the ones in the studios are charging around about two thousand a day um so you know um and then there'll be retouch fees if there's if there is retouching needed so yeah somewhere in the middle of all that the the logistics of going to this must yeah. must be quite challenging because you've got obviously your equipment going away for five weeks so you need to take enough underwear and toothbrushes um but but equally things like visas and work permits and who does all that sort of stuff for you yeah so um the visas are done by my um, by my client they um sort all that out so i send them everything i need yeah and they book all my hotels transfers flights that's all kind of taken care of for me and i just i have to send them particular information passport information etc so that's all done really that's made very easy for me um the most difficult part and the bit that doesn't keep me up awake at night but it just makes me think a lot is backing up (laughs) i thought you were going to say carrots then (laughs) <laughs> no, it's all of the, it's the backing up yeah. minefield yeah, yeah. of turning around shoots very quickly and saving it and getting it somewhere on for the client to see, um, for them to use on social media for it to be ready as well as saved as well as protected. My head's going around lots of different. But I was listening to the Fuji cast a couple of weeks ago, and someone was travelling. Yeah. to europe for five weeks that's right and you and kevin were trying to work out what they should do because they weren't taking their ipad well, they or... didn't want to take anything did they no which, which must and be was, the opposite to you i was traveling to a shoot listening to that thinking what on earth are they doing just buy yourself an ipad pro <laughs> yeah. that's what i've got that's what i use for all my edits um Wait, and, so uh, is that powerful enough to oh, to deal yeah, with yeah. A, I, to deal with a gfx 100 it's amazing is i've it? got i this is a crazy thing i bought myself was it three thousand seven hundred pounds for a macbook pro fully Fully spec. Yeah. Oh, I don't know, two years ago. And it was fine for a while. It was good, you know. But then I found that if you're doing big edits, it wasn't, I think because the, the MacBook Pros and all kind of main desktop computers, they tend to edit in full resolution. Yeah. And so you are having to deal with the full resolution. Whereas the iPad Pro um, on Lightroom edits in a, um, a low resolution. So a proxy um, sort of fashion. Yeah. And you can steam through an edit on with the pencil i literally i've never edited so fast um with them than, than with and, the, and even i shoot uncompressed raw files oh, on the 100 that? it's like 280 megabytes of yeah. a, a picture yeah. and it just whizzes through them there's no late there's no lag or anything 
So there's no, um, no latency at all? Wow. No, it's brilliant. I'm so impressed. For the speed, it's really worth um, worth doing. So I've, um, I've, I've always used Photo Mechanic to sort, but of course you can't do those. I don't think there is a Photo Mechanic app. No, so, I, so. Use, um, I actually use just the very large thumbnails, um, Lightroom, and I bring it in and I just, with the Apple Pencil, just literally go through and select the ones that I'm going to bring in. So you're doing it all within, yeah. yeah. Only bringing in the ones that wow. the ones that I feel are kind of decent and and um, I want to use, and everything else just gets wiped. Yeah. And it's it with the pencil. I just I love editing like that. Yeah. Um, and actually, Capture One. I've just downloaded Capture One for iPad. It came out really recently, and they have made a fantastic edition of it. It's a completely new version of Capture One, just made for iPad. Um, I'm not using it professionally yet. I'm still kind of toying with it because they haven't put the graduated filters on yet. There's still, I don't know why they haven't done that, but they've tethered it. It tethers to your camera. The workflow is so much nicer than Lightroom. So as soon as they bring um, the filters on there, I will be on. Um, and and the, the screen size on, of an iPad Pro that you've got is? Yeah, it's the big one. So what's that? 13, is it? 13, okay. Yeah, there's 11 and 13, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. It's 13. Um, it just sits, it sits really nicely. Oh, the, um, uh, yeah, the last time I saw the price, it was easily under half the price of the, the ticket that you gave me for the yeah for, for the uh, for the MacBook Pro. I'll just, yeah, I'll never buy one like that again. Yeah. Not now you've got, not now they've done this. And that, they did say with this release, it was going to be like your new computer that you know, you're never going to need a laptop again, didn't they? That was the whole thing around this iPad. Oh, okay. And it, I think they're really, they're 75% there, I think. There are a few things still to yeah. iron out, but they're definitely on the way. And our thanks to, uh, to Chris Orange, who has probably done a pretty good job on making Kev want an iPad Pro. No, he hasn't. <laughs> How did I know you were going to say that? <laughs> Kev, look, I've got a box. Yorg, Yorg, that lovely Yorg that delivers stuff, has said he had a spare iPad Pro with the M1 chip. Do you want it? I'd rather use an etch sketch. <laughs> etch <a> sketch. <laughs> I did chuckle internally as I was talking to Chris about about that, and I thought, I wonder whether Kev will fast forward through this interview when it gets I, to I that. I did point. have to. I did have to go through the the Apple pain again this week, though. Why? Where the you know to, for the account thing. All right. Because we we got Sky Glass. TV at home, yeah. and they've given us a free six months Apple TV Plus subscription. Mm. Mm. And uh, I don't subscribe to like Netflix comes with the Sky thing and yeah. all that kind of stuff. So I, if it's free, I'm like, yeah, okay, of course. But I had to had to re log into my Apple account, at which point it said, we have sent a six digit code to your iPad, <laughs> which is in the cupboard in Spain and hasn't been turned on in about 100 it years. It did not say any of that. Uh, <laughs> it is, that's exactly where it is. Um, but, um, but there is no, I found. They, they, they've obviously listened to me um, because there's now an option. Want to see? send your code another way? See, Kev, yes. it's yes, not the devil in disguise anymore. Um, yes, the, well, no, they aren't still. But anyway, so I have. We've now yeah, Apple TV has infiltrated our um, television, yeah, and it will for six months. But they will not be getting a penny off me. We went it's, through the same thing, by the way. Yeah, off, uh, gone. Hang on, we went through the same thing with uh, with Thomas's uh, Microsoft account. He, yeah, he, there were two. There were two email addresses, and it kept sending us to the wrong one. And I tell you what, they're both they're both as awkward as each other when they want to be. That's just so, nice. just so, Kev, I've got it in here. Oh, forgotten I had this. Isn't that amazing? When you open up a cupboard and you find something you forgot you had. This was supposed. To, I was supposed to be sending you this in your Christmas card this year, but I've eaten half of it. Guinness caramel chocolate bar. Mm. Really nice, mm. Kev. Nice. Anyway, I was just going to say it wasn't that I was looking for. Here, where is it? Uh, here we go. Uh, there is an iPhone six. I've had it for years. I didn't trade that one in. I thought you might like it, just so for these moments where you want to. It's right next to your thirty-five mil. That's <laughs> yeah. just <laughs> the, the drawer of love. Um, no, it's okay. You can keep yeah. your iPad. Uh, your <laughs> iPhone. My iPhone. Okay. Are they like the older ones worth more? Worth a bit of money now? Are they? I think so, yeah, because there's like some weird app people out there collect Apple things, don't they? There, <laughs> there are, the, you know, the original that those um, uh, what would they be called? The CR is it CRT screens? Was it CRT? Cathode, cathode ray tube. That, that's it. But yeah, the monitors. The monitors. Do you, do you remember the really big sort of bulby one that that Apple had that came in different colours? I think there was a purple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They is are it worth the Apple a Lisa or something. Is it? Yeah. No, I know. No, yeah, I know what you mean. Though. Yeah. Worth an absolute fortune now. 
Yeah. Absolutely. They were cool fortune. looking things, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but Space Age. Yeah, they were. Right, back to your, um, your oh, quickly first, thank you to uh, Pick Time, pick-time.com for their continued love and sponsorship of this programme. The best way to show your pictures if you want to display them to, to clients. And don't just use it for weddings and social photography. I know plenty of people that, and I have myself used it for commercial work to, uh, to, to wow your clients because... When they uh, when they go to pick time, to look at a gallery in pick time is like looking at a website, isn't it, Kev? It's looking like a well. It, it's like looking at a well designed, well thought out, tactile experience website, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's just a very very easy way of. Um uh, you, you know, it's like a business in a box, yeah. effectively. Yeah. But it, like it, it it blends perfectly well with your own website, so it doesn't look, uh, you know, it doesn't look like they go into a different website or anything like that. It's, it's their own. I sell it to my clients as, you know, you will get your own private website with your yeah. images afterwards. It's great. Yeah, yeah, perfect. And if you want to take up the offer, we were talking about offers earlier. We were talking about the offers you put on for your clients within pick time when you're presenting images to them to look at and buy. But if you, wa- if you want to enjoy the experience of using pick time yourself as a photographer and you've never used it before what should we do kev you should go to pick time.com you should check it out with the code fujicast all uppercase all uppercase capital letters yeah fujicast and you'll get one month perpetual one month free right questions is it my turn or yours your turn Raphael alicia hi guys uh, Thor- that's a lovely name it isn't is it? isn't it Raphael alicia I mean i would just buy a photographer with the name Raphael alicia I'd, I'd, their work would obviously be have to be good but i just trust it would be because i've got a name like that wouldn't you yeah yeah thoroughly enjoy the show i know many others have mentioned this but there's definitely something therapeutic a thera- therapeutic therapy we just invented a new word thera- therapeutic about listening to you both not it's sure reception. <laughs> it's reception, yeah. may i found my word kev that's the one <laughs> <laughs> not sure whether it's the promise of sparkling new fuji gear or, or the dulcet tones of uh Neil's English accent. Am I very English? I would say, yeah, I'd say, I wouldn't say, so I, this is always interesting to me, mm-hmm. funny enough, because I feel like when English accents are uh, portrayed in American TV shows, they, yeah. they try and give them that kind of 1950s um, BBC voice. Oh, uh, the sort of Pathé voice. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. England um, have lost I, the I football again, but nobody cares. It wasn't a real World Cup. That's it, yeah. That but one. you don't have that kind of twang. But no. you certainly, I don't. You don't have a, like an accent as such. No. Um, not like you know, as if somebody was from London or whatever. But you, you definitely have a uh, mellifluous tone. It's called received pronunciation. Oh. RP. See, the nice thing is, if you come from Yorkshire, so I come from Yorkshire. Lovely. Or, or like you, come from Wales. Got a bit of a. What, what is your Welsh twang? Where are you from? What part of the the valleys? Newport. <laughs> Newport. That's not the valley. No the valley there. There's no valley in Newport. Yeah, a few I valley thought, commandos, but thought you were going to say Merthyr for a minute. Oh, no, good lord. <laughs> <laughs> and RP <laughs> essentially means you're an, you're an orphan of an accent. You, you've got an orphan type accent. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Raphael, do, do you want to guess where Raphael comes from? Um, Raphael Alicia. I'm going to say Italy. Italia. No, it comes from Australia. Have you ever been? <laughs> 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 I would love for us to do an Australian adventure. When we've won the lotto, Kev, we uh, that's what we should do. We should go on a, a road tour, take a, a great big snake catcher, and we should we should go on a, a road tour of Australia. And we shouldn't go through the... Uh, we should try and cut through the middle of it, the bit that's really difficult to get through and overheats. Yeah. <laughs> it would be... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You and I. I would love to go. I've never been to Australia. You're right, and I would love to go. Yeah. Anywho. I have a question for Kev. I've heard a lot about older sensors and the fact they tend to look more like film. Or, actually, today, as you found out, the X-T5 sensor looks a lot like film, with uh, with more space per pixel and generally softer results. With this in mind, and after seeing Kev's family images taken with the original X-100, that's a long time ago, Kev, that one, just, I, yeah. I picked up an X-100 at my local camera store, and I'm trying to use it as my monochrome camera. I'm strictly a straight out of camera shooter, and this works quite well for my uh, X Pro 3. I'm trying to emulate the experience of shooting film without the patience for shooting film. But naturally, the X100 has less in camera options. And so, my question to Kev is dot, 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 how much post processing 
did you do on the black and white shots you took of your family with your X100? I love the texture and vintage quality of those monochrome images you made, but my concern is that you can only achieve this look in post. Keen to hear your thoughts on your approach. Many thanks. Keep up the good work. Raphael. Uh, right, so if it is the images I'm thinking of, which back in the day were the original X trans sensors, then I was shooting JPEG. Yeah. Um, but in in uh, Lightroom, I would give them a little bit of contrast or clarity punch, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, and that was mostly it. But the yeah, the black and white Acros didn't exist at the, in those days no. in terms of the film simulation. So it was the black and white film simulation with the red filter which gives it a nice contrasty tone. Um, and that was it. Yeah. And, you know, cause it, again, if we're thinking right, right back to that first sensor it was 12 megapixel sensor. So anything over about 800 ISO was like did have snow some storm. grain in it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so it just looked naturally organically filmic, which was, which was very nice. And, and, and actually as sensors have become more, uh, you, you know, as 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 they become more mature, uh, you know, people often ask. You know, one of the questions about the XT5, for example, I got asked a lot was, "Oh, a forty megapixel sensor? Does that mean it will have more noise in a uh, higher ISO?" Um, and actually, I kind of embrace noise in the sensor. I love, I like to see noise in sensors. But is it is it a lot more noisy? Uh, actually, no, now now you now you've proposed that. No, 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 not at all. No. Not at all. No, no, I can't notice any difference between the two cameras. You, you, you know, we, it's nice to have some some character in images, and and if noise is introduced at what well, no thirty two hundred ISO, great. Who wants a, who wants to be able to shoot at thirty two hundred ISO and have a crystal clear image? What's the point? You know, you, you want to you know you want to you want to get some emotion. You want to get some soul into the images. Mm. That's my my opinion anyway. I'm sat in here looking out of the window, <laughs> snow falling, my voice breaking. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of a little bit of snot dribbling down my face. Oh yeah, this is horrible. <laughs> my mum's oh. messaging me. <laughs> what does Gemma see in you? I just... <laughs> uh. <laughs> I've just looked on MPB, by the way, um, and this might well be gone by the time this program goes out. But the um, the X one hundred, there is one on there, Kev. Uh, it looks like the original, the yeah, the the originale. Um, uh, what are they going for? Well, it looks like one that's been in, in your camera bag. To be honest, uh, I mean, it says heavily used cosmetic condition. Um, I think they should have a, another um, uh, probably description on there. Looks like something Kev would have owned, <laughs> <laughs> but because uh, it does look a bit beaten, the, the 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 plate at the bottom is yes, I'd say that's scratched. But it does. I mean, this is there's a certain charm to this, Kev. I'm looking at this camera thinking there's charm to that camera. It all works. Let me see the details, then I'll tell you the price. Oh, obviously, it works fine. It's got And it's got a six-month warranty on it. Comes with a battery charger, a battery. Uh, but it's just it's just this heavily used cosmetic condition. How much do you think an X100 would be uh, as a heavily used cosmetic condition camera? 300 quid. Not bad, actually. A bit more. 239. Oh, that's a bit less. Yeah, yeah, and I'm saying yours a bit more. Um, oh. but yeah. um, <laughs> two, 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 yeah. two, three, nine. That seems a good, yeah. good price. Yeah, I, I th I've seen like reasonable, reasonable versions of them go for like fifteen hundred quid. Really? Yeah. Blimey! Uh, because they are quite a collector's, yeah. collector's thing. But you know, it's I've got all my, I've got all my X one hundreds, all all five of them. But um, bar this one, obviously, because this is this looks like one that I've seen in your bag before. <laughs> yeah, no, I've still got all my original X one hundreds, and I I wouldn't sell them. No at all because it is that that that's the collection really for me is it all the others can go like yeah. the, once they once their so their life has been done on it on the, you know the xts and all that kind of stuff they'll they just get so slung you, in a box and sold off to mpp or whoever it is they're gonna end so up with. s s or t you 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 not bothered about or or v or f no or gone. all my x i keep all my x100s oh i I'm thought you meant ah oh, right i thought you the other cameras get, yeah oh, so right sorry when once, said, once their working life is over then they, right. they get sold on ah i see okay but you've kept your one but not my x100s so you got the 100s the s the t the f the v yeah yeah every single one wow yeah that's yeah. a love affair with that camera really isn't it i mean yeah. that was the camera that was your gateway drug anyway wasn't it 
yeah that's that's what the, that like that's their it, it, marketing thing for the x100 really is that it's the gateway camera to the future film ecosystem yeah yeah um, yeah, they wouldn't call it a gateway drug. I realise they that. wouldn't call it a gateway drug. That's for sure. <laughs> no. Right from the, uh, did we answer that question? I think we did. We did. We did. From the book of face, Kev, yours. Daniel Parks, good old Daniel Parks. Hi, Kev. Hi, Neil. I just wondered how experimental your focal length journeys were during your early days. Mm. <laughs> uh, we all tend to start with whatever lens is attached to our first ever camera. Absolutely. But as yeah. time goes on, we learn our preferred operating distance i just wonder if either of you had had to persevere with a focal lens that you weren't particularly happy with whilst you fine-tuned your experience was it a straightforward process or a meandering learning curve oh, over time? Yeah. Well, i think it was a meandering learning curve i started really just by in in the valley of i started in the valley of the zoom really and and didn't move out of it for for many years i don't know why i didn't uh I didn't, but I just, I suppose because much of my work was in the studio to start with. Uh, so it would have been a 24105 on a Canon. What would have been, because I, I had the uh, Nikon cameras to start with. So I'm not quite sure what the Nikon equivalent to that lens would have been. But if we just say 24 to 105, I stuck with that. But it wasn't necessarily a very exciting lens. And it did make, and it, and it, and it, it, it made, made for a bit of lazy photography, I think. Um, I'm not suggesting just because you use a, a Zoom, you're lazy. It's nonsense. But I just th think this this wasn't a particularly it's an f4 lens. It wasn't a very dynamic lens. It's kind of like that trustworthy thing that I st <laughs> still have one. That's that's something I've not got rid of. But but it's not a particularly exciting lens. The first Prime I ever bought that really changed the way that I started certainly showing stuff online. And the picture that I have on the front of my, my website today, that image of the, the, the black and white image of the lady, uh, the sort of, I, I like to think, I think it's quite a dramatic image, quite emotional image, was taken on a 24 millimeter lens where I really had to learn to get in close and not be afraid of, of um, having a presence within the scene. And I think that 24 millimeter told me or taught me more about photography than any other lens. Mm. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, similar. I've never used the zooms. When, even when I started with Canon, I wasn't a zoom user, but Did I always okay. used the 3585 scenario. So the 85 F1.2 Canon lens, which was beautiful, and the 35 mil, I think it was a 1.4 lens. It was, yeah. And, and yeah, ultimately I've stuck with those two. So I never really went, I, I, I very, very, very infrequently deviate away from those two focal lengths and now of course i've moved to 18 in fujifilm which is more towards the 24 yeah. rather than the 35 end of things but yeah mostly it's it's been one wide one short no zooms yeah ish bash bosh job done <laughs> easy as yeah did you have a 70 to 200 and a 50 to 140 then with fujifilm i, I had a 70 to 200 with my canon system yeah and I did used to, because I used to be one of the um, Bristol Bears rugby side, pitch side photographer people. And so I used to use it for that. But yeah, that, that was it. I, I, I mean, the day I sold off all my Canon gear, I literally had so much stuff that, you know, that I never used. And, and you came out with spare cash, I would have thought, for the Fujifilm system. I did, yeah. No, well, that was the joke. I, I kind of flogged it all off, got my X Pro One and the three launch lenses, and still had enough money to buy a car. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. A car? Yes. A car? Yeah. No, Kev. I bought Gemma a car. Yeah. <laughs> that's how much oh. stuff the Canon, uh, that's how much Canon gear I what had. What sort of and... car did you buy her? Don't you dare say a Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was only a, uh, it was like a Peugeot 3 or something. Or it's not bad though, Kev. <laughs> yeah, bought... yeah, yeah, it was fine. But it was, you know, it, it, I mean, there's two things about that, isn't there? One, I had too much stuff. Sport yeah, spent too true. much money on too much stuff. Yeah. Also, that the, the price difference between then, certainly DSLRs and the, the new mirrorless stuff was dramatic. You know, the mirrorless yeah, stuff yeah. was cheaper. And so it was it was an easy choice. Wow. <laughs> I like you had quite that much stuff. God. Um, ben Middleton. Hello, chaps. Second time writing in. A few questions for the two of you. Uh, don't expect you to answer them all. He said, in brackets, or any. All right, we'll move on then, shall we? Have you got a question <laughs> for us? <laughs> no. Um, number one, the X-T5 seems to be my perfect camera, so it's save up time for me. 
Not bothered about the 40 megapixel sensor, but that form factor with the IBIS is just what I've been waiting for. And what, what, uh, tell us about the IBIS system in the um, before I go for the rest of this question, Kev. I think this will be the last question of the show because there's three here. But uh, so the IBIS in the XT5 is, I believe, pretty much the same as the one in the XT4. It might have a slight extra half a stop of. Mm-hmm gyroscopic stabilization right. um but yeah basically you know the ibis now is 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 essentially normal in most cameras whereas only 18 months ago ibis and fujifilm cameras were like i ah, can't be done yeah <laughs> and that's true, everything. Yeah. yeah he says with the ibis is it right that it's more effective on mid to telephoto lenses rather than the wide angle i'm considering whether to trade in or keep the xt3 and thought i might hang on to it and weld the 10 to 24 on it for landscapes. So have the two of you noticed any improvement in image quality on, on your X-T4s with wider angle lenses? Yeah, so, I mean, he's he's right about the... It will have more impact on longer lenses, but that's, that's not necessarily because of the technology. It's just because of the way that people use cameras with longer lenses. You, you're going to have more natural shake with a longer lens, a heavier lens so you probably won't notice or need to notice it so much if you're using wide angle stuff unless you're shooting really kind of slow shutter speeds and stuff so yeah that does make sense but it definitely has you know i noticed on the xt4 immediately when i had that the you know certainly in churches and things like that i could shoot at slower shutter speeds and and have more reasonable images out of it Mm. that was definitely a thing of course we have to remember with ibis is it's it's in camera stuff it will not legislate for you messing up the exposure or for the speed of people moving people are moving uh, faster than your shutter speeds it's still not going to fix that issue that's something you need to do with your exposure corrections um i'm a gardener oh where's this going kev and i love to see worms my wife (laughs) Uh, sam (laughs) used to eat worms no no that's wrong i've got that wrong no it was wood lice. Well, when she was a little girl. As a little... <laughs> I don't Some know. Some wood lice killer. <laughs> I know. I look at her now and I, I can't see that at all, but there we go. Um, but just listen to your episode in which somebody asked if worms were still a problem in Lightroom. I've got to say, I was sceptical about these worms, but I'm having big wormy problems at higher ISOs using my X-T3 at 1600 and above. I'm using the latest camera firmware and version of Lightroom, it's so bad for me, I've switched to Capture One, which has no wormy problems at all. Perhaps it's the way some graphics cards deal with the processing, question mark. Anyway, yes, it's still a problem for some people. We were talking about the fact that you and I have not seen the worms, but uh, clearly the worms are still there. The worm has turned. Yeah, oh, I'd be interested to see what the, the sharpening settings are on, on, on his Lightroom. Yeah, well, maybe, it's, maybe, yeah, maybe, it's that. maybe, Ben, could you write back with your sharpening settings? And then we can yeah. do some wormy, just, t- wormy just tests. Just take all your sharpening off. Take it all off completely. Yeah? Zero, zero it out and what, see what you get. What do you do if you want to sharpen your image, though, Kev? Well, then you start from zero. The, the Lightroom starts um, the sharpening process at 40 automatically, which is too much for Fujifilm files. Um, now, this is and- a revelation for some people because I don't think we've ever said it quite so clearly as that before. Yeah, well... It's, it's true. It used to be 25. They used to sharpen future film files at 25 and then they upped it to 40. And that's just too much. So um, my import presets always bring the sharpening back down to 25 default. Right. Um, and yeah, I, I, it's, I bet it's that. Would that, would that, that. would that deworm Ben? <laughs> Probably would deworm Ben. Yeah. Might not de wood lie Sam though. <laughs> 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 ben, you need a wormer. That's what you need. <laughs> They're very expensive worming tablets. Did you know that? I don't know. Do you bother worming Git? Uh, when he needs it, yeah. When he no, <laughs> when they do that thing where they start crawling along the floor <laughs> with, their, <laughs> oh, <laughs> with their legs bent, just scratching their bums. Oh. That's it. Usually oh, on your oh. finest carpet. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. it. Um. <laughs> Barney just spits his worming tablets out. You can't trick him. I've tried to put it in food. I've, I even get this. I even with a drill. With I'm, I, I drilled into. This can sound horrible for those that don't like the idea of it. Duck's neck from if you were looking along the neck, and put in uh, the worming tablet. I thought there we go. Got you now. Managed to mm-hmm, push it around his mouth, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and then out again onto the floor. Ducks, <laughs> ducks neck gone. Tablet on floor. Yeah. yeah. 
Right, no, our dogs are pretty good at taking that stuff. Yeah. Um, um, number three. Uh, last one. I took your advice on using a program to cull photos before editing, so I'm using Fast Raw Viewer, and it's mm -hmm. excellent. Is Fast Raw Viewer one you know about, Kev? Yep. Yeah. Very good. Good. Okay. Very good. It's it's a it's a little bit like Photo Mechanic, just a kind of different company. As Zippy, I would say probably not, but probably Zippy enough. Okay. So he says, thanks for the tip on that. I've also started using Topaz Denoise AI as a plug for Capture One. So uh, that's for high ISO photos. It is amazing. So two-part question. My workflow is fast raw to cull, Capture One, then Topaz Denoise if I need it. I'm interested to know what extra software you use in your workflow um, and if either of you use separate denoising software. Uh, if you do, how much sharpening do you do in that software versus back in the main editor? Well, I'll answer for myself, first of all. My workflow is Photo Mechanic, um, Lightroom. I I don't actually sharpen my images very much. Perhaps I should. I'm beginning to feel, Kev, I'm missing a trick here by not sharpening stuff. And, and, and then out it goes to the big wide world. Simple, simple pimple. Yeah, I, I'm the same. I do have um, the Toolpad Suite, which is very good. And occasionally my... Um, push something through like a very high ISO one that needs recovering, but yeah. it's it's not a regular occurrence. Um, and yeah, that's the same thing. Yeah, sharpening, sharp. Remember, sharpening really should be done at the end rather than at the beginning of the process. And yeah, output sharpening, good to go. Are we making life too easy for ourselves, Kev? This is very unlike us. <laughs> I think. I think. Um, yeah, perhaps. I don't know. Maybe we're just old. We need a few worms in our life, Kev. That's what we need. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not watching you drag yourself along the floor in the living room. Let's <laughs> see that that day. That'll be, <laughs> that'll be the end of it. That's it for this side of Christmas. Um, we, we are here for a pop-up just prior to Christmas, but um, we will see you for... Uh, 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 in the that's it then, before Christmas? Yeah, that's it, no Kev. Christmas has just crept oh, up. Do you want to do a Christmas special? Do you want to do one before Christmas? Should we do nah. one? No? <laughs> <laughs> you are such a Scrooge. <laughs> uh, we, could, we could do. I don't mind. We could, if we can find the time, we'll do it. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah, we've got weddings like mad going up to Christmas, haven't we? Uh, yeah, I still got some stuff going. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Well, let, let's let, let's discuss off air. Yeah, we'll discuss off air. If not, we're going to see you Boxing Day. Um, yeah. Maybe not Boxing well, Day, but the day after Boxing Day would make more sense because nobody wants to listen to us on Christmas Day or Boxing Day. Surely, Kev. No. Um, yeah. Well, happy Christmas, everybody. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Ha have a good. And, um, and and we will see you to the side uh, for a bit of a Christmas special. Kev will be yeah. wearing mistletoe somewhere, I'm sure. Yeah. As long yeah. as it's not his belt buckle. I don't want to be involved in any of that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, it's we'll, mistletoe and thumb. <laughs> that's it. We'll see you just after Christmas. Bye-bye, Kev. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The Fuji Cast is an independent Loading Zone production. Email the show with your questions and words of wisdom to click at fujicast.co.uk. Email any complaints and political nonsense to our wives who will deal with your comments in their own good time and in their own good way.